Hey, you remember I told you that when you do these inspections, oh yeah, look at those eggs and larvae down in there at the end of September. That's so rewarding to see that. Um, that will stop if I, if I don't start feeding them as soon as the goldenrod stops. What's up, I'm David Burns. I'm pumped up and fired up about today's video. You told me what kind of a video you wanted me to make next, and you said you wanted me to make one on how to feed bees in the fall, how to feed bees in the winter, and how you evaluate a hive to know whether or not to leave honey supers on or not. We're gonna do just that today. We're gonna open up a hive. I'm gonna evaluate it right before your very eyes and show you how I make that decision on whether that hive needs one super, two supers, or if I can take both of them off and just feed them through the winter. Also, an ultimate class giveaway coming up. While we're in that hive, I spotted something that was kind of odd, and I'm gonna see if you can figure it out. The first person who can rightfully identify what I'm gonna show you on one of the frames will win a free ultimate class online beekeeping course. First person to leave a comment and describe what it is. So be watching for that during the video. That's worth 269 bucks. The winner of our last Ultimate Class giveaway was Colton Christjohn. He actually pinned down the exact moment the hummingbird flew behind me in a video and he won the Ultimate Class. So uh, Colton, if you will just email us and let us know you won it, my staff will get that class sent right out to you. Before we get things rolling, let me tell you about a neat thing that I made. It's a getting your bees through the winter course. I had this available online as an online video class. It's really good. But I also have it available in a PDF file that you can purchase and download. Look at that. I even drew some of the graphics in here. <laughs> but this is over 20 pages of information that talks about vitelogenesis, bees of winter physiology, feeding bees, varroa mites, how to get your mite levels down. And it talks about should you wrap hives, should you put them in a greenhouse. It talks about uh, top bar hives and doubled walled hives, you know, things that might, a lot of people might think that would help your bees get through the winter. Some tools and tricks to overwintering bees. Talks about wrapping your hives, should you wrap them. So take a look. This is not a book, it's a PDF file that you can purchase and download, and then you do what I do, punch holes in it, you can put it in a book like this and enjoy reading it. So I'll leave a link below in the description how you can obtain this great information that I've gathered up over the years and combined it in this PDF file. You'll enjoy that. Hey, without further ado, let's just jump in that hive and get the ball rolling. Hey, look at this, two supers on. And both of them, I think, are pretty full, actually. I don't know for sure, we're gonna take a look. Got some small high beetle up there, but we're gonna take a look, see what kind of uh, honey stores they have. The question is, how do you decide, now that we're getting close to winter, do I take a super off and harvest it and leave them one for winter? Or do I take them both off and harvest it? And maybe they have enough in the deeps below? Or do I, leave them both on, and hopefully they'll make it through winter. How do I come to a conclusion like that? How do you decide how much honey to take off? Looks like we can start about right here looking at some frames. Oh, that'd make a nice, uh, that would not make a really nice honeycomb. Harvest that and cut the comb out, put it in a jar or something. That's just a frame that they made their own uh, comb on. Really nice. Wow. Let me think. Uh, no queen excluder. I'm looking for making sure the queen isn't up here. Sometimes you would find her on this middle frame, but just big frame of honey. Yep, it's pretty good stuff here. Should I take this super and use it for myself? or leave it for them. It's just a big frame of capped over honey. It looks a little darker, the cappings, and that's because just the way the wax has settled up, kind of a little more honey saturated wax than this one here that's a little more white in color, maybe a tad bit newer capped over honey. 
I don't want to pick this up because it's so heavy, but I'm going to have to. I should have practiced what Dr. Max was talking about, the chiropractor that told us we should uh, strengthen our core and get ourselves in the shape before we lift up this 50 pound box of honey here. <laughs> and, uh, oh boy, here we go, huh? Got a little gap. I'm going to have to fix this before winter with some tape right here. Well, I want to see the next, uh, got to see the next one below it. So we're just going to have to cowboy up and get her done. That's a phrase I like to, to say when I'm really working hard and putting my body into this kind of a... It's like, you got to cowboy up and get her done. It's not quite 50 pounds, but it ain't light. I'm going to set it on top of my top cover. All right. Whew. Now we're back into this super below it. See, we don't know if we can take this super off because there could be brood in here, right? There's brood in here. We're going to leave it. Looking down from the top, though, I don't really see uh, that that could be much more than... It's capped over honey at the top is what I'm saying. Let's do a little bit of smoking to save time and pull one of these black all plastic frames out because usually they're not drawn out larger than the frame itself. This is nine frames as well because they're sitting inside of nine frame spacers on the edge. A nine frame spacer is usually a piece of metal that makes the frames fall directly into place when you have nine frames on. Yep, I don't see any brood. I see some open cells, but it's nectar. And they're got most of it capped over. Look at these little lines here. Do you see that line that goes that way? A line that goes here. If you can tell me what causes this line, the first person to answer that question correctly will win the ultimate class. What causes those lines and is it anything to be concerned about? So what we're doing is just determining is this all honey Nectar capped over. Has a has a queen laid up in here at all? Uh, I don't see any eggs on this one. Again, pretty lightweight. Mm, zero brood, and they're capping it over. We're gonna look at one more. You ready? We should have smoked it, right? How many need to smoke it before we lift this out? Let's do that. Here we go. Remember in the fall, and it is fall for me, for everybody I guess, <laughs> you really have to smoke in the fall. Don't want a robbing frenzy happening. Oof. Mm-hmm. All right, there we go. Handle this frame correctly. Look at that. Nice frame of honey. So there's no sign that the queen is up here laying any eggs. So we do have two supers that are mostly honey and able to go through the winter with these two supers. We're gonna to have to look one more down below to see what's up down there. We well, gotta make sure we're getting some bees of winter physiology. Mm, propolis. There we go. Oh yeah, it's heavy. Oh, that must be some new frames I put in there. That's some very, very new looking frames. This is an older looking frame here in the middle. Interesting. How about for the sake of time, we pull this one up right here next to the old frame. 
and get a better visual on what's on it. What's on it and what's in it, right? I can tell this, this piece of uh, frame on top has had a little bit of a smear of propolis on it. It's kind of darker like it's been varnished with propolis a little bit. Oh, perfect. Gosh. I mean, on this side here, you can see the queen has got some winter bees brooding. <laughs> so that's awesome. Quick check of the queen. Hey, you remember I told you that when you do these inspections? Oh, yeah. Look at those eggs and larvae down in there at the end of September. That's so rewarding to see that. Um, that will stop if I, if I don't start feeding them as soon as the goldenrod stops. But remember I told you that if you're dangerously uh, mishandling frames, you could kill your queen. And this time of the year, if you kill your queen, it is over because I don't think you'll have any luck getting a new queen either made it or purchased from queen producers this late in the season. It's hard to ship uh, queens when it's really cold outside. Got down to 49 degrees last night. So be real careful with your frames, especially when you handle your frames or when you put them back in the, into the hive. Make sure you're not going to kill your queen. It will all be over. Oh, this is just another great frame. Look at that, capped over. This is like the end of September. These bees I will see way into April and May that, are, that will um, actually emerge out of this. Probably, oh, in the next week or two. I can't tell you how happy I am. Have I said that yet? Look at that larvae. I really need to stop looking because all these frames are full of brood and I don't want to kill my queen. I've seen enough to know this hive is in good shape. But one thing I haven't noticed, and I'm going to show you this in detail. This is where this whole video comes together for you. All right, are you ready? Let me just jump in here right now and say, wow, did you see that developing eggs and larvae? And here it is uh, the last week in September in Illinois. That's phenomenal. What that means is those bees that are developing those eggs and that very, very young larvae, they need to be well fed by nurse bees. And the only way they can do that is if the nurse bees are well fed. That's why as soon as this goldenrod run is over, the nurse bees are gonna, their glands are gonna dry up of royal jelly and therefore they won't be able to raise all that larvae and it will die. They, they will actually become carnivores and consume, eat, the larvae in the hive instead of raising it when the nectar flow stops. That's why I'm showing you right now, look at those eggs, look at that larvae in there. We have got to supplement right now at the, on the heels of, of goldenrod drying up. Let's get some one-to-one -one in there with some protein, uh, amino beads, some honeybee healthy, and feed them from the top and let's get some food in there so they will continue to raise these bees of winter physiology. Now let's get back in. I'm gonna tell you how I'm gonna decide if we need to take the supers off and use them or if we need to leave them on there. We're gonna do it by looking at the three frames here, okay? These three frames here will tell us how much stored honey that they have on board if I were to take what's above the brood nest area. I'm going to take this frame out next to the wall. What do you think? Do you think it's going to have stored capped over honey on it for winter? Or is it empty? Not going to have the queen over here, are we? All right, here we go. Okay, look at that. Perfect. No eggs in the open cells. It's all nectar, all capped over honey. Yep. No queen. Let's look at the second one next to it. This is how you make decisions, people. This is how you make decisions, class. Thanks for watching my beekeeping channel. I hope this really helps you out a lot. What we're doing is determining how much actual honey is stored in this hive itself around the brood nest area, especially and specifically in the top deep. They can utilize that, right? 
this is going to help you answer the question. And there's those lines again. First person to tell me what causes those lines, leave a comment below. You'll win a free ultimate class. You see the lines in the honeycomb I'm talking about? Don't jump to a conclusion. It could be something else. Aha, bee bread. Woo! Always a good winner thing. Next frame over, I do see brood and honey. So we only have these two frames here that show promises of stored honey. Because now we're getting into the brood area. Oh, there's a beetle I smashed with my finger. <laughs> Take that, small high beetle. I've got a friend that really gets excited when he kills a small high beetle. All right, we're going to put this hive back together and I'm going to explain to you what data I've gathered to tell me whether to add more, leave a super on, take them off, how, how exactly to feed this hive for the winter. Well, okay, we took a pretty good look at the hive there. And what I decided about the hive is I like the super that's right next to the brood nest area. It seemed to be the best capped over and the, the most completed. The super above it, uh, the white super, it was not bad. It was capped mm -hmm. over, but it also had some frames that were mm -hmm. almost mm -hmm. kind of like nectar, not quite capped over all the way. <laughs> There's bees pretty close by. And so, uh, my decision on this particular hive, since I really don't need the honey right now, got some other honey from other hives that uh, are much more plentiful than that one. So I'm gonna leave the two supers on, mainly because in the brood nest area, I've got a lot of brood. I pulled two frames out, as you remember, near the wall, and they had honey on them, but only two. The third one next to them had brood in it. So if that's true, I only have two frames of honey on the edge wall, and that's four frames. That means six frames in the middle have developing brood in it. And so as soon as that happens, those bees are going to be hungry and so on. I don't have enough, I don't have enough honey down below in the brood nest area, in my opinion, in that top deep to help me get through the winter. I think I'm going to need both of those supers. I'm going to go ahead and feed them my winter bee kind. That's going to be helpful. And since you and I saw that they had eggs and developing larvae in there, I've got to feed them or they'll stop doing that. Now, I don't have to stop right now. As you can see, they're hitting the goldenrod really hard and heavy. I'm going to keep my eyes on that. And so as soon as the goldenrod kind of dries up and it's over, I'll judge that by how much foraging activity I have, usually around noon. And that way, if I see that kind of die off, immediately I'm going on there with my burn speeds feeding system and feeding them only from the top, never from the entrance. I hope that helps you. So let's say that you looked in your top deep and it's jammed with, with honey. And if that's the case, you could go ahead and remove your uh, honey super or two above them because they've got plenty of honey above the lower brood nest chamber. They've got one deep full of honey or mostly full of honey mine didn't. So I'm basically deciding what will it take in the amount of honey to get this hive all the way until I can do something in the month of April. So if I feed them now as uh, long as I can uh, until it drops below 50 degrees liquid one-to-one -one, with my Honey Bee Healthy, with Amino B Booster, with protein powder on the top with my Burns feeding system, I'll do that until the temperature gets in you know, starts getting so cold that they're not going to drink sugar water much anymore. And that's usually, for me, about the end of November, 1st of December. And then I'll switch over to my winter bee kinds. That's the harder candy with all the proteins and aminos in it. And I'll put that right on top of that top super. Yep. Let me put my hat down. <laughs> I had one bee that was like, oh, you need to move out of here. But anyway, I'll put my winter bee kind right on top of the white super. So I'll have two supers and that winter bee kind. And that winter bee kind is gonna be helpful should the winter be really hard and they would need more food than what the two supers and the winter bee kind could give them. All right, quick tip. 
sometimes when the winter is really around 30 to 40 degrees, that's when bees will kind of just not do much. If it gets colder than that, they're gonna consume more honey to stay warm. If it gets warmer than 30 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, they're gonna consume more honey because they're moving around. So that's not always predictable where you live. If you live in a warmer winter climate, they could eat more of your winter stores. But for Illinois, we get really, really cold, and believe it or not, they'll cluster, and that cluster will devour honey where that cluster is in order to generate and use that carbohydrate to generate the thoracic muscles to make heat. So I have to feed them because they're burning through food the colder it gets. Does that make sense? 30 to 40 degrees is the perfect temperature where the bees aren't consuming, uh, well, let's say they're consuming the most minimal amount of resources to stay warm at 30 to 40 degrees because the cluster itself is making a lot of heat. So that one there, I could take a super off and probably get away with it by slapping on winter be kind after winter be kind. Gonna do that anyway, but I'm gonna leave the two honey supers on. And I'm making that decision based on a lot of brood that's both eggs, larvae, that means the nurse bees need food to take care of those, and a lot of capped over brood, that means those new bees are gonna wanna eat as well because they're gonna become nurse bees and want to eat to make royal jelly to feed the larvae. So I got a lot of brood that needs fed, and if I steal one or two of those honey supers, it's gonna put them in a deficit. That's foreign to what the old paradigm is. The old paradigm is take the two honey supers off, enjoy the honey, and then feed the crap out of your bees with two to one sugar water and help them build up for winter. Ah, oh, does anybody see that that doesn't make sense at all? Come on. And then they wonder why the bees die? You rob everything they stored for winter and expect them to make it through winter. I just don't think it's gonna happen. Now again, let me summarize, if that top deep had maybe five or six frames of capped over honey in it, and I had three or four frames of super above that, I'd be willing to take one or two supers off. Just don't have it there. I hope that's helpful for you. Now, when I started keeping bees, one of the things that beekeepers taught me to do was go behind the hive and lift it and judge whether or not there's enough honey on board so that they could survive the winter. Unfortunately, this is not a real reliable source. There were many times when I implemented this kind of lift and measure if it was heavy or not heavy. And I thought they were really heavy, had a lot of uh, honey on board. But what happened was sometimes my bees would die in the winter time with a lot of honey around the cluster. And I just couldn't figure out a decade ago, what was that all about? Why would bees die with honey all around them? Then I discovered what was happening in my operation was I wasn't really raising a lot of bees of winter physiology. I had the resources, I had the honey to get them through the winter, I didn't have the bees. I took a poll on my YouTube channel and I asked beekeepers a question, are your bees ready for winter? Get this, 47% said absolutely yes, 17% said no, and 36% said sorry I have no idea. If I take 17 and add it to 36, I get 53. 53% of beekeepers right now do not have a clue if their bees are ready for winter or not. That correlates with about the percentage of bees that we, that we lose each year, beekeepers lose. Aha, we're on to something. Now I'm sure since I mentioned the Burns feeding system, that you'll want those, and I think those are coming back in stock this week. And I'm sure since I mentioned the Winter Bee Kinds that you'll be interested in those too. All these links are in the description down below, and I hope that will help you uh, what I've explained today on getting your bees through the winter. Just because this has good honey on it, and just because it has a lot of bees of winter physiology, if it has a lot of mites that have been spreading viruses, it may not make it through the winter. So if you have a hive like that, where everything is perfect as far as resources and brood and it dies, it's likely to be because of all the generations of populations of the brood, a lot of mites developed and mites could have spread viruses and the bees will die in the wintertime from those viruses. As the bees die from viruses, 
less bees are able to keep the colony warm and so they just freeze out from low populations because bees are dying early. The bees under the cap is going to make it four to eight months and uh, if they're virus free they'll live out to that four to eight month period. So if they emerge in October then they're going to be November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June. <laughs> wow! But mites will kill them half-life. If they emerge in October, that'll be November, December, January, they'll die and freeze out, the ones that are infected with the virus. So, kind of tricky, you've got to navigate that, you've got to think mites as well. And so I put a mite course together if you really want to get into controlling mites. Take a look at my online uh, mite control course that I've put together and that would be a real big help to you. Be Team 6 members, you've got that free, uh, so be sure and look at it and follow my tips on controlling your mites. I'd like to introduce you to a new staff member that is designated to help me make YouTube videos. Yeah. This is part of my new YouTube creator team, the first member of my team, the Tripod Stabilizer. Look at that. Jeez. Thought you cat lovers would love that. Well, thanks guys for watching. It means a ton to me that you're a part of this beekeeping channel. I really do appreciate you so much. And thank you for all the kind comments that you leave. It encourages me to come back out, make some more videos to help you along in your endeavor. Don't forget if you want to be a B Team 6 member, I'll leave a link down below. That's a mentorship program that I offer throughout the US, uh, running just over 200 team members where they can contact me and ask me questions and such. Uh, probably one calling right now. <laughs> so uh, I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.